Exodus chapter 33. Turn with me in your Bibles. Exodus chapter 33. Begin reading with verse 12. It's a pivotal time for God's people in the Old Testament. If you're able to stand, stand for the reading of God's word today. I'll let you be seated quickly after. Exodus 33 and verse 12. Moses had come down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments just to find God's people. They were restless. They had made for themselves the golden calf, and they were worshiping that. And we all know the story. Moses threw down the tables of the law that God had given them, and Moses was upset, and God was upset. God said, I'm going to blot their names out. Moses said, don't do that. If you're going to do that, just blot my name out too. You've given me this people to lead. Help me to lead them, God. Forgive their sin. And God made a way for them to be forgiven. Now God is preparing to give Moses the law again. And he's telling Moses that I'm going to send you into the promised land. And this is where we pick it up here in verse 12. And Moses speaks to the Lord. And he says, you have been telling me lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and have found faith, and you have found favor with me, talking about Moses. And then Moses said, Now, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways. Somebody say, Teach me your ways, Lord, so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And then the Lord replied, My presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. And then Moses said to the Lord, if your presence does not go with us, then don't even send us out to the land of promise. God says, I'll give you the victory. I'll give you the land. And Moses said, if you're not coming with us, we don't want that. We don't want the victory. We don't want the land because it's nothing without you. What a shame it would be for a church today to say, you know what, God, we'll take your blessings, we'll take your gifts, we'll take worldly success, but we'll give up your presence. We can never give up the presence of God. Somebody say amen. Today we're going to talk about the truth about God's presence. The truth about God's presence. Lord, we love you, we thank you that you truly are in this place today. Your manifest presence is here. God, you've made yourself known in this place today, and we praise your name for that. God, we receive what you have for us today. Now teach us something about your ways and about your person today, God, and how we can move forward, God, with your presence in our lives and in our church today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. We're finishing up a series, and I believe this will be the last a part today talking about the truth. In the first message, we learned that the truth is not just merely facts. It is more than facts. It is more than even principles and laws. The truth is a person, and his name is Jesus. We learned the second week about sin, that sin is not just breaking religious rules or even going against the Ten Commandments. But that sin is a monster that will destroy us. Sin is a disease, like a cancer that will eat up our spiritual health. And then we looked at the next week the truth about the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is God's power for every single believer. He is a gift that God wants to give to his children. And then last week we talked about the truth about the church. That the church is not a place. The church is a people. The church is not for us. We are the church. If you believe that, say amen today. And in the uh, third part of this series, when I was talking about the Holy Spirit, I asked a question. What is the greatest need in our church right now? And that question was answered in that message. And here's what I believe that is the greatest need for our church or any church today is for a fresh touch of God's presence from heaven. 
That is the greatest need of any church today. It's not more resources. It's not better programs. It's not better preaching. It's not better singing. It's not more people or a better location. The greatest need for the church today is a move of God's presence from heaven today. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning as we close out this series, the truth about God's presence. And here's the first point today. Number one, God's presence is possible. There are even some churches today that say, you know what, the time of God's presence coming down and moving in a powerful way among his people, that was only for the time of the early church. That was only for the times in the Bible. That was only for the times when the 12 apostles were present and before Scripture was finished. But now that Scripture is done, all we need is the Scripture. And by the way, I thank God for God's Word. Somebody say amen. But God's Word is here to reveal God to us. We're not just to worship God's Word. But God's word is here to reveal God himself to us. But they say that that, now that we have God's word and that time has passed, that there is no more of a moving of God's presence among God's people. But I'm here to tell you today that God's presence is still possible among God's people today. In verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me to lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. And then the Lord replied, my presence will go with you. This is not just a dead word for Old Testament Bible times thousands of years ago today, but this is a living word that I live out personally in my life every single day. And we ought to live out in our church every time that we come together. When God says, my presence will go with you, this is a big deal, a big deal. When we talk about God, what do we mean by by God? There are some scientists, not all scientists, by the way, are atheists, but there are some scientists and some philosophers that tell us, first of all, they will be quick to tell you there is no God. But if there was... If there were a God, he would not be concerned with us at all. And we would not be able to interact with him. We would not be able to talk with him. We could not be with him. We could not know him. And I want to tell them, you just need to be quiet because you really don't believe in God in the first place. So don't tell me what you think about a God that you don't even believe in in the first place. But the truth about God is revealed to us in his word. And first of all, God's word tells us that God is. It doesn't explain him. It doesn't give the arguments for him. It says that God is and that God has created all things. Everybody say all things. And then the Bible defines all things. It says anything that was ever created, then this God created those things. And that tells us a couple of things about God. Number one, that tells us that God exists outside of time. That's what we mean when we say that God is eternal. And then it also tells us that God is uncreated. I've heard scientists and philosophers on YouTube and on the Internet, and they say, well, if God created everything, then who created God? And they're not getting it. You see, God exists outside of time in eternity, and God is the only uncreated thing because he created everything else. It also tells us that God is unseen, and yet this unseen eternal God has chosen to reveal himself to his and through his creation. And then it goes beyond that and it says then that God is personal and God is accessible. God is personal and God is accessible. One of the greatest Old Testament writers and worshipers was not by far uh, the, the, the greatest or the most pure Old Testament person, and that is the, the name uh, of King David. King David was a great worshiper, and he knew how to get into the presence of God, but he made great mistakes. How many of you know he made bad mistakes? I mean, murder and adultery and a bunch of other things. He did some really bad things. But his greatest redeeming quality was not his ability to lead men into war, although he did that fantastically. But his greatest redeeming quality was that he realized the importance and the priority of getting into God's presence. And this is what he says in Psalms 23, verse 4. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear any evil because God is with me. 
I can go through anything as long as I know your presence is with me. And then in Psalms 139, David said this, where can I go from your presence, Lord? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, then you are there. Sometimes when people go through times of tragedy or we have national tragedy or, or global events that are terrible, people will ask the question, where is God? Where was God on 9-11? Where was God in the tsunami? tsunami? Where was God during COVID time? And in Jeremiah 29, God answers that question and he says this, he says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. In other words, my I am there and my presence is possible, and if you're not experiencing me, it's not a God problem. It's a you problem. You're not wanting God to be with God bad enough because God's presence is possible. Amen, somebody. God's presence is possible. And then secondly, God's presence is powerful. There is an effect that God's presence has in our life and in our church. In verse 14 of our text this morning, the Lord replied and said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. How many of you need rest today? Some of you need rest and you refuse to get it and that's why you get sick because God's just making you get rest. Say, Pastor Todd, are you saying that God makes us sick? I'm not even going to go there today. But, but there is rest in God's presence. Not only is there rest in God's presence, but in his presence there is life today. In God's presence, there is supernatural provision for your life and for our church. In God's presence, there is joy. In God's presence, there is victory. And in God's presence, I'm telling you today, there is power. Not only are all those things in God's presence, but when you think about it, all you need is God's presence. If all those things are in God's presence, then all you need today is God's presence. That's why David said in Psalm 16, in your presence, not just there's joy, but in your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So, Pastor Todd, why do we always start our service with singing? Because David said to come before the Lord's presence with singing. Come into his courts with praise and with thanksgiving. There's a song that we've sung before, and it goes something like this. All I need is you, Lord, is you, Lord. All I need is you. Why? Because you hold the universe, and you hold everyone in earth in the palm of your hand. And I'm telling you today, God's presence is possible, God's presence is powerful, and all you need in your life today is God's, God's presence. David continued in Psalms 23. He said, I'm not afraid when I go through the valley of the shadow of death because you are with me. Your rod and your staff there, they comfort me. David understood something about God's presence. That word comfort literally means with strength. When God's presence comes, it comes with all the other attributes of God, including God's power and God's strength for your life. When David came out of the armies of Israel, he wasn't even a soldier. He wasn't even a messenger boy. He was just coming to bring his brothers lunch, and they were in a stalemate in the battle, and, and Goliath had come out, the mighty warrior, the mighty man of valor, and David said, you know what? I will go out, and I will fight Goliath. And King Saul said, how can you do that? He's a mighty man of war, and you are just a boy. You will not be able to stand against this Philistine. And David said, I can stand because the Lord who is with me uh, in when I face the lion and the Lord who is with me when I face the bear, he will be with me against and he will deliver the hand of this Philistine into my, into my hand. Later on, it says of Saul that King Saul was afraid of David, not because of his slingshot, not because of his uh, ability to lead men in the battle, not because of his fame and popularity, that Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, and he feared him. Why? Because God's presence is powerful. In Genesis 15, God tells Abraham, among other things, but he says this, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. What's he saying? He's saying, Abraham, all you need is 
was me. God called Gideon to go and fight the multitude of the enemy that outnumbered them a uh, 100,000 to one, it seemed like. And God spoke to Gideon prophetically, and he said, Gideon, you are a mighty man of valor. And if you read the story, he wasn't a mighty man of valor. He was a coward. But God said prophetically, you're a mighty man of valor. Go in this thy might. What was the might of Gideon? It was that God was with him because there is power in God's presence. In Joshua 1 and 1, Moses is dead and God does not even take a half second to grieve over his man. Moses, the Bible says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life because as I was with Moses, I will be with you. That's why you can rest in the power of God's presence. You don't have to worry about your enemies. You don't have to worry about your strategies. You don't have to worry about resources. You don't have to worry about your own weakness. All you need is God's presence in your life, and all we need is God's presence in, in our church. Jesus came not as God, although he was God, he came as the Son of God. He came as a mere mortal man, and when he began his ministry, he didn't say, here I am, Jesus, look at me. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is with me and is upon me, and he has anointed me. He has given me power to preach and to heal and to do miracles and signs and wonders. In the last few weeks, people have noticed that there is a difference in our services. And the difference in our services is not, is not about who's not here. It's about who is here. Somebody say amen. It's about the presence of God coming down among his people as we welcome his presence into this place today. God told Isaiah, he said, fear not because I am with you. The enemy that seems greater than you will not be able to prevail against you. No weapon formed against you will prosper, not because you're great and strong and powerful, but because I, the Lord God, am with you today. And all you need is God's, God's presence. Next, God's presence is possible. It is powerful, and God's presence is is precious it is precious what does that mean that means that it's valuable that also means and you can look this up in webster's dictionary that means that it is is not something to be wasted it is not something to be wasted god's presence is precious today verse 15 then moses said to god if your presence does not go with us do not send us up from here. In other words, Moses was willing to fight for God's presence. I talked to Miss Charlene this past week, and she's not here today because she was very sick on Wednesday. And she's very sick today. She has COVID, and her husband has COVID, and her daughter has COVID, and hopefully she didn't give me COVID. Somebody say amen. Amen. Sandra said, why didn't you lay hands and pray for her? I said, because she might have had COVID. But I did pray for her. I just prayed for her from, from a distance. But I was sitting and talking with her at, at about a distance away from me on a couch. And I said, you know what, Charlene, sometimes you got to fight for God's presence. And I thought, is that biblical? Didn't he say, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you? If that's the case, why would we have to fight for God's presence? Because God's presence is conditional. God's presence is conditional. In the garden, God is walking and talking with mankind, but something happened. There was a problem, and again, it wasn't a God problem. It was a man problem. And God wasn't the one that went away. God was the one that went looking for man. But because man had sinned, man was afraid, and man ran and hid from the presence of God. And God today is going along in the world, and he's going to churches today, and he's saying, I want to pour out my presence. I want to pour out my power upon you. I want to bless you. I want to give you favor. I want to be with you. I want you to know me. But churches and people are running and hiding from the presence of God. Maybe because they're afraid. Maybe because of their sin. I don't know what the problem is, but there is a problem in the garden. Sin caused man to hide from God's presence because God's presence is conditional. 
Again, like he told Jeremiah, you will seek me and you will find me when, here's the condition, when you search for me with all of your heart. What am I saying today? God's presence is precious and sometimes you have to fight for the presence of God. Moses fought for God's presence. Before our text, God told Moses, I am upset with this people, and I'm going to fulfill my word. I'm not going to blot their name out because of you, and I'm, I'm going to send you into the land of promise. I'm going to give you the land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to give you the military uh, victories. I'm going to let you move into houses that you did not build. I'm going to let you reap from vineyards that you did not plant, but I'm not going to go with you. And Moses said, the heck you aren't. You're going to go with us or we're not going to go if you don't go with us. I told my wife many years ago, I said, you know what, you can leave me at any time, but if you leave me, I'm going with you. Moses said, God, I'm going where you are, and I'm not going to be without, I'm not going to be without without your presence. Moses fought for God's presence. Jacob literally had to fight for the presence of God in his life. His brother Esau was fighting mad at him, and he was coming after him with 400 assassins. And they would come across the river the next morning, and the Bible says all night long, Jacob wrestled with the Lord. He wrestled, he said, I, and he said, let me go. God's acting like he couldn't get away from Jacob. How many know he could get away from Jacob? He said, let me go, but I hope you don't let me go. He wanted him to fight for the presence of God, and Jacob fought for God's presence. David fought for God, God's presence when he had sinned, and he said, Lord, whatever you do, don't take your Holy Spirit. Don't take your presence from me. And then in the New Testament, there are two disciples that are walking down the Emmaus Road, and they don't know that they're with the Lord, but they know there's something different about this person. He's talking like Jesus used to talk to us. He acts like Jesus. He sounds like Jesus. We're not sure if it's Jesus because their eyes were blinded that it was him, but they knew there was something about him that, that, that had they had the presence of God with them. And the Bible says he acted as if he would keep going up the road, and they compelled him to stay with them what were they doing they were fighting for God's presence in their in their life because God's presence is precious it is conditional we should never take God's presence for granted somebody say amen high priest of Israel one time took God's presence for granted and another prophet had to come to him and prophesy the word Ichabod and he said, the glory of the Lord, the presence of the Lord has departed because you have taken God's presence for granted. It is precious. And I want the, the musicians to come to the instruments. If the instruments went to the musicians, that would be something, right? Lastly, God's presence is a promise. It's a promise. Don't let anybody tell you that the manifestation of, and when I talk about God's presence and like David said, I can't go anywhere to get away from your presence. But we don't always have an experience of God's presence. But what I'm talking about is when God makes himself known. When God influences our surroundings and our life in such a way that we know that it is God, that we know it is God's, it is God's presence. It is a promise. And here's what Moses understood that we need to understand today. Moses understood that the promise was not the land. The promise was not the victory. The promise of God is not that you won't have to fight. The promise of God is not that you won't have to struggle. His promise is that he will be with you. His promise is bigger than his presence. Like Christmas presents. His promise is bigger than the land. The promise is his presence, and the power is his presence. And sometimes we covet the property when we should be coveting God's presence. God, I want what you can do for me instead of, God, I want, I want you, Lord. I want you. What good is the property, Moses said, if we don't have your presence? But God said, I promise, I will be with you. But you got to be hungry, and you got to be thirsty, and you got to want it. And you may
may be in a pit today, and God is the only one that can pull you out of your pit. We're fixing to take Holy Communion together, and as we take that, we remember the blood of Jesus Christ, and the blood of Jesus Christ is powerful. What can wash away my sin? Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can cleanse me. The blood of Jesus can forgive you of your sins, but the presence of Jesus will keep you from sinning. Now, don't, don't let that go over your head this morning. That's not just a preacher saying to make you say, wow, today. That's a revelation from God's word right there. The blood of Jesus will forgive you of your sin, but the presence of Jesus in your life will keep you from, that's why not just young people and young adults, but all of us, it is so important that we get into God's presence in worship, that we we activate our faith by stepping out in faith and coming to the altar when we can. We lift our hands and we say, Holy Spirit, come down upon us. Because the Holy Spirit, that's the promise of God's presence today. Jesus said in the end of Luke, he said, I send you the promise of my Father. The promise of my Father, the gift of God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. Moses said, I'd rather lose with you, God, than to win without you. Because ultimately, you are the victory. When Jesus said we should pray, he said we should end our prayers. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory. Everybody say glory. And I'm closing with this before we take communion today. We need to be like Moses today. We need to say, I'm, God, I'm not moving without your presence. God, I'm going beyond just knowing about you, knowing who you are. I want you. Moses said, I'm going to lead these people. I'm not going without you. God said, I'm going with you. And Moses said then, and Moses could have asked for anything. But Moses said, now, God, here's what I want. God, show me your glory. And it wasn't a bunch of big signs and wonders and earthquakes and fire and wind and all that kind of stuff. In fact, when we read what happened, when he said, show me your glory, the Bible says the Lord said, I'm going to cause my goodness to pass in front of you. And what am I going to do? I'm going to proclaim my name. I'm going to show you who I am. I'm going to tell you, reveal to you who I am. And this is what he says. He says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. But this same God is a God of justice. Yet he does not leave the guilty un." punished. There's some people today that believe that everybody's going to heaven. Nobody's going to go into eternity without, without God. And if that's the case, then why did Jesus die on the cross if everyone's going to be saved anyway? Moses said, show me your glory. And then God revealed himself to Moses. The Apostle Paul said it like this, oh, that I would know him and the power of his resurrection and the glory of his, of his sufferings. The glory of God is in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Everybody stand on your feet with me this morning. You say, Pastor Todd, I want more of God. How many of you want more of God in your life? Raise your hands right now. I want more of God. And you're going to stay right where you are because we're about to take communion together. But if you say, Pastor Todd, I want more of God in my life. I need more of God in my life. And if you want more of God, if you need more of God, then seek Him. Seek Him. Seek His person. Not, not signs and wonders. Jesus said an evil and an adulterous generation goes after signs and wonders. You say, Pastor Todd, are miracles bad? Are signs and wonders bad? No, they're not bad. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying what Jesus said. That we don't seek after those things. Why? Because we seek Him. I want to know you. You 
are the one that loved me so much that you died for my sins. And I want to know you. And I want to know your heart, God. And I need your presence. I need your power in my life today, God. But are we willing to seek him? Are we willing to pray a little bit every day? Are we willing to begin our day with prayer, to end our day with prayer? Some people, the only time they pray is when they eat. If God's lucky, that's the only thing. Some of them, they don't even pray then. Pray, seek God's face. God said in the Old Testament when he came down, his presence came down, his glory came down in the Old Testament temple and tabernacle. And by the way, we are the New Testament temple and tabernacle today that God's presence comes down in. But when God's presence came down, he said to his people, if my people will seek my face and pray, if they'll humble themselves and repent and turn from their wickedness, then will I come down from heaven and I will heal their land. Lord, we seek you today. Come on, lift your hands to heaven one more time. Lord, we seek your face today, God. Lord, we invite your presence into our life and Lord, into this church in a greater way than we've ever known before. God, send revival to this place. God, come down in this place and spill outside of this place into our city, we pray, God. Lord, our city needs more of you, more of your presence today, God. Lord, you are the answer today, God. You are the victory today. You are the promise today, God. Lord, we seek your face this morning.